Good afternoon, I'm Mike Chair. We are on the air with breaking news. Governor Sununu updating the state's coronavirus response. Uh, own, uh, Elliot Perry is going to be on there, so we all want to watch um, Elliot. So we'll be very cognizant of time. So with that, let's kick it off with a public health update from Dr. Chan. Great, thank you and good afternoon. So just a brief numbers update for today. Uh, we are announcing 461 new people diagnosed with COVID-19 in New Hampshire. Uh, in the last week, we continue to average around 350 to 400 new infections uh, per day. And in fact, the last few days, um, th the daily number of new infections that we have announced has uh, started to slightly increase. Uh, part of the reason for this increase actually is that we are actually seeing um, more infections in the last few days at some of our colleges and universities, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. And in fact, out of these 461 new people today, diagnosed with COVID-19, 141 of those are associated with colleges and universities. Uh, and so in the last week, we've been averaging probably about 90 new infections per day at colleges and, and universities throughout our state. And so we continue to work with um, our educational institutions to do the contact tracing and the investigations to figure out why we're seeing some of the increases and to implement measures on these residential um, school campuses to try and break the chains of transmission uh, and continue to be able to host in-person learning and continue with um, the educational objectives. Um, there are 3,048 people with active infection. Uh, our test positivity rate continues to average about 4.4% um, over the last week. This has been stable in the last uh, several days. So while it's uh, substantially down from in weeks past, in the last week or so it uh, has been hovering around 4.5%. Uh, and thankfully, hospitalizations are down. We're at 126 people hospitalized with COVID-19 statewide. Uh, just of note, this number 126 was the number of people hospitalized at the peak of our first wave of the pandemic uh, back in April and May. So an improvement from where we were, but still uh, high levels of hospitalizations, high levels of community transmission still throughout the state. And then, unfortunately, two new people who have died from COVID-19 that we're announcing today, both of these individuals are associated with long-term care facilities, uh, bringing in the total number of people that have died during this pandemic in New Hampshire to 1,150. Uh, so we continue to uh, recommend and encourage people to please get vaccinated when it's offered to you, but please also continue to practice the social distancing, avoid the group and social gatherings, and please wear face masks when in public. In fact, there, there was a new study put out in the last week by the CDC, which showed that if two people are together in an enclosed space and both individuals are wearing masks and both individuals are wearing masks that are multi-layered and well-fitted, that if one person has COVID-19, the other person's exposure could be substantially reduced by more than 95%. So masking continues to be one of the key or the core mitigation measures that we have to prevent spread of COVID-19. Uh, and this study highlights the importance of everyone continuing to wear face masks uh, when in public locations uh, where other people may be present. And I will hand things over to Dr. Uh, Daly for a vaccine update. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to provide an update on progress with our vaccine administration. To date now, we have administered 228,000 doses of vaccine here in New Hampshire. This includes 156,000 first doses and 72,000 second doses of vaccine. That means at this time, 11% of New Hampshire's population has received one dose of vaccine and 5% of the population has been fully vaccinated. This week, we received a slight increase in vaccines, 22,475 doses. And next week, we'll receive another increase to 27,740 first doses. So this is an increase of over 5,000 doses for next week. In addition to our state allocation, additional vaccines are coming into the state through the Federal Retail Pharmacy Partnership with Walgreens. And in terms of the long-term care facility pharmacy partnership, all of our facilities that have enrolled with that program have had at least a first dose clinic and 75% have ha also had their second dose clinic. So they're scheduled to complete all of those second doses by the end of this month. These pharmacies do go in for a third visit. It's a catch-up visit where they can vaccinate anyone who started the series at their second visit. And all of these visits should be completed by the end of March. Our regional public health networks have been conducting clinics for long-term care facilities that did not enroll in the federal program. 
19 long-term care facilities have had their first dose clinics through these regional public health networks, and five have also had their second dose clinics. The rest of those second dose clinics are all scheduled. In terms of an update on the equity allocation program, it continues to grow as our regional public health networks engage their partners that serve vulnerable populations. Since the beginning of this program through this week, 44 vaccination events have been scheduled with plans to administer 4,400 doses of vaccine, which is about 71% of all the vaccine that we've allocated to this program to date. Many of these events are serving lower income senior housing. Our state and hospital run clinics continue to operate and are administering more than 4,000 doses on most days. We still are scheduling first dose appointments for who, anyone who registers new in our system, and those appointments are available in April. And then we also have plenty of second dose appointments for you. So if you are due a second dose and do not have an appointment, please reach out to us at 211 so that we can make sure that you get that second dose. Thank you, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Chivinette. Good afternoon. We're going to uh, continue to look at the positive trends in long-term care outbreaks. I am pleased to announce we are closing 13 outbreaks today. Um, they are listed on the, the, the slide and we are only opening one new outbreak at Mount Carmel Nursing Home in Manchester. This brings us to a total of 11 institutional outbreaks, eight of which are in long-term care. So over the last several months, we have seen this uh, continue steady progress in our outbreak numbers in our institutional settings. I'm gonna shift gears away from COVID just for a moment to talk about pediatric psychiatric care. Um, over the last several weeks, we've seen uh, the children's wait list for psychiatric beds at historic levels. As of today, I've commissioned New Hampshire Hospital leadership to dedicate 10 beds at New Hampshire Hospital to serve children with mental health crisis. This uh, is something that we have done for many, many years and just transitioned out of children last year. So we are going to allocate one of the units that we have in the building that were was previously serving adults to serve children, at least temporarily for uh, through probably late spring. Given the, what we understand about the acuity rate for, for the kids, we anticipate that the wait list will be brought down fairly quickly as we bring kids in to assess, evaluate, and discharge with an appropriate plan of care back to the community. Um, this temporary move will be in effect until late spring. Um, we will continue to work with our community providers to execute our long-term care, our long-term strategy, which is something that we've bid out and procured over the last several months. And we're in the phase right now where we're about to start awarding some of those contracts. So we will uh, execute our long-term strategy to increase access for vulnerable kids, both inpatient and in the community. In addition to that, Hampstead Hospital is working over the next several months and anticipates having additional beds become available in May at their hospital. And finally, we are working with our uh, partners in the community to actually open up additional adult capacity to make up for the beds that we will be taking offline at New Hampshire Hospital to serve children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner and Dr. Daly and Dr. Chen. A um, couple data tables. We haven't looked at data in, in a little while, and every, as everyone knows, we t tend to be very scientific-based, data-based, uh, metrics-based, so folks understand very transparently what we're doing and why. So there's a few slides we're going to show here. Uh, as Dr. Chan said, this is our percent positivity, so the rate at which we are detecting positive cases of COVID across the state. As you can see what happened here in the spring was our, our big surge. Um, a lot of that was also due to the fact that, you know, we weren't at the time, didn't have the ability to even test asymptomatic individuals. Um, obviously, as, as we've been able to do that, the numbers get a little more accurate. And you can see the second surge in p positivity rate, uh, you know, over on the, the right side of the, the chart there. You can see we're, we're actually have leveled out over the past few days over the percent positivity. Frankly, that's the university system. Um, and, and the good news there is a lot of those students tend to be asymptomatic or just have mild symptoms, uh, but it is creating a real pressure on the university system. And as a lot of folks know, both UNH and um, um, 
Plymouth State have both gone remote. I think they're both in a fully remote learning model right now, um, uh, trying to make sure that uh, we're also minimizing a lot of the social contact. I know it's a shock that college kids like to be social, um, but uh, it is creating a, a real pressure. And, and there is a lot of this is driven by COVID fatigue. I've been on the phone with the university system uh, and, and different, both the presidents and uh, some of the, the members of the boards and the administration, um, uh, they, they still have, I think, very good protocols, aggressive testing protocols, that's terrific. Uh, but I think it's more just a factor of the students getting a bit of COVID fatigue, but we all have to stay very disciplined with social distancing, uh, minimizing the social interactions, wearing our masks and, and those sorts of things. And so hopefully this little temporary plateau, which is also being seen across the country, you, you see university systems across the country having the exact same problem. We're not unique in this one. Um, uh, but like we said, the good news is the vast majority of those individuals are asymptomatic uh, or with mild symptoms. And, and so hopefully it's something that we can we can remedy um, in, in the short time frame. Um, hospitalization. One of the key metrics that we, we look at is hospitalization and fatality. Uh, and this is the number, the daily count, the daily census of individuals in hospitals uh, on any given day. And as you can see, we peaked out at one point just about 350 beds in our hospitals were taken with COVID patients just a, about a month and a half ago. Um, and you can see this very steep precipitous drop uh, with the number of individuals with COVID, uh, just over 100, about 125 today. Uh, and so obviously that is on a very positive trend. And again, I go back to what I say all the time. This is all done to make sure we're not overwhelming the, the healthcare system, overwhelming these hospital beds. The good news is while we've had this, this while we had the, the real spike here, a lot of hospitals were able to stay open, especially for emergency services, but even for some selective and elective procedures. And obviously, as that number comes down, hospitals have more flexibility. The whole system uh, is uh, is able to to function as as it really should without the, that burden, if you will, of, of the COVID beds and the quarantining. Um, this also very much helps with workforce and staffing nurses, doctors, a lot of those folks can be back into um, this atmosphere because they were quarantined uh, very much when there were, were, were more outbreaks and, and whatnot. Uh, but this allows more workforce flexibility as well, which is always always one of our challenges. Uh, and then un unfortunately, this is our, our the seven day average on fatalities uh, having uh, deriving from COVID. So obviously we had our, our spring surge here uh, uh, sorry, the uh, yeah last spring's surge and then this winter's surge, as you see over there. But again, a very precipitous drop in fatalities, which is, a, I think, a combination of both the seasonality of this latest surge combined with the fact that vaccinations are going out. We have a very high rate of second vaccinations in our long-term care. If you look at our the number of vaccines we've given in our long-term care facilities, we are one of the highest states in the country in terms of administering that second vaccine, well over 50 percent. Most states aren't even at 50. Um, have already received their their second vaccination, which is a really, really great sign. Um, and within the next couple of weeks, that, that program will, will um, kind of go through their third iteration of, of offering a vaccine to individuals. So uh, we've been doing a very good job there, and that's what this is all about, making sure our most vulnerable citizens and those that take care of our most vulnerable citizens are prioritized with the vaccine. And obviously we're, um, and we'll keep watching these numbers. And as these numbers hopefully uh, bottom out, and we and we know that they can be stabilized. That allows us to to make more um, fle create more flexibility with any of the the few restrictions that we do have in the state. We can keep building on that flexibility. And uh, as I've I've been saying for the past couple of months, I really think Memorial Day is is a, a good marker for us to to know that we're going to have a strong summer. Um, I think we feel very confident that we'll get through not just group. 1B, but even two are uh, well into the, the 2B group of vaccination. And, and those are our most vulnerable citizens by far that make up the vast majority of these fatalities and hospitalizations. And as we get through that, um, that's going to give us a lot of confidence to, to create more flexibility. The, the second issue uh, that I want to talk about before we open up for questions really builds on, I think, a lot of the, the aggressive, proactive measures that the Department of Health and Human Services is taking around behavioral health and mental health uh, for children. Um, so on, on March 16th, a year ago, it's uh, unbelievable to think that we're, we're almost a year into this whole, this whole uh, pandemic. On March 16th, 2020, the state did make a very tough decision of, of bringing all schools remote. And then as folks know, we, uh, Dr. Chan and his team created a great set of guidance documents that allowed schools some flexibility, knowing that every school is a little bit different, so that they could come back to fully in-person or a hybrid model of learning, or even be remote if, if they so chose. Um, and what we found is that 
um, about 60% of the schools, just shy of 60% of the schools in the state, have some sort of hybrid model. The kids are at least coming in a few days a week, which is great. Um, I think about 35, 40% are in a fully in-person model. And there's still a few schools out there that are still fully remote. Um, in the coming days, um, I think probably tomorrow, I will sign an executive order that um, really uh, says that all schools have to come in back into at least a hybrid model of learning at least a couple days a week starting on March 8th. All K-12 schools must provide the option of in-person learning at least two days a week uh, starting on March 8th. That is going to give schools at least uh, at least a couple weeks if not a little more uh, to really make sure that they are fully operational with an in-school model. Uh, hopefully and I believe most schools that are even fully remote have been gearing up and preparing for this. I think they know that that um, that at some point in the spring that everyone had to open up uh, and provide uh, this model. It, it isn't just so the kids come back and have a more fuller robust learning model. It really is for the behavioral and mental health, the isolation issues that so many of our students um, have been bearing with. Uh, we see that number of kids in our emergency rooms uh, waiting for a bed um, to get uh, evaluated and, and work through the community mental health system or, or other opportunities that they can have uh, to deal with a lot of these issues. But there's no doubt that the issues have been vastly exacerbated by COVID. Uh, and there's no doubt that allowing these kids, everyone, everyone across the state to be in an in-person model is going to have beneficial effects uh, for these children. Um, you know, we'll continue on our path in terms of, of vaccinations. Uh, group 2A is essentially the teachers, and we, we're already working on a model to make sure that those that as soon as we're ready to go with group 2A, uh, we can get the teachers vaccinated in, in, a, in, a, in a quick and safe way. But the data is all very clear, whether it's the CDC, the state, everyone has said that there's no reason that these uh, schools cannot open even without a vaccination. And, um, and the model has been, has been borne out uh, time and time again. And a big thank you. I just want to take a moment and say a big thank you to all the teachers and the administrators who have made those sacrifices, who have changed their traditional model of education to make sure that they can stay open in some way. It is those individuals, those schools who have really provided a model of success for others to look to and copy to. And if you have any questions about how to do it, uh, chances are the district right next to you uh, is already doing it. So pick up the phone and talk to those folks. And we have a great collaboration amongst our superintendents and our school boards. Um, so uh, there's no reason uh, that this can't be done. It can be done very successfully. Uh, and we're giving um, schools uh, about about two weeks or so uh, to actually make it happen. So uh, it can be a hybrid model. It doesn't have to be five days a week, but it has to be at least a couple days a week to get some eyes on these kids, get that personal relationship uh, reestablished between students and their teachers, which can um, really benefit the child and, and the kids in, in so many different ways. With that, we can open up for questions. Paula, how are you? Um, hi. I was interested in, in what form of law or um, what you're using to um, mandate this. Um, and whether other states have looked to this and have you used another state model? Well, prior to COVID, schools had to stay open. Prior to, to COVID happening, we're just going back to eff effectively that model. We're still providing some flexibility, but schools have to be open for kids. Now, if schools want need to close for a day or two for, to clean or, or something like that, or temporarily if they have a, a cluster of illness or an outbreak, of course, they, they're allowed that flexibility. But anything beyond that would require the expressed uh, written consent of the commissioner and, and our office. So um, for anything, for any extended period of time. But we're just basically going back to the way it was, if you will, uh, and using the same um, tools that we have in the toolbox to ensure that schools stay open for these kids uh, in more of a traditional sense. And with other states, are there other examples in other states? Oh, there's states all over the country that have, that have said, yes, schools have to be open. Absolutely. We're not the first by any means. Yeah. We've allowed a lot of flexibility for our districts to gear up, time for them to gear up. The, the money, the resources, it's all there. Um, I mean, most schools still haven't even drawn down on their, their additional COVID money. That's, I think, of the first round of, of, um, of additional COVID funding that was provided, the $37.5 I think as of last week, maybe $7 million had been drawn down by school districts. So there's still a lot of funding and opportunity there. And that doesn't even include the additional $150 million that they in the second round that they've already approved. So there's a lot of resources and opportunity there to do this and do it right. Uh, Governor, with the Massachusetts schools on vacation this week, New Hampshire next week, uh, why not wait to at least see if there's a bump in cases after uh, February break? Because the, a, a bump in cases is, look, we've had 10 times the number of cases that we're seeing today, and schools have still been open successfully. So um, if, the, if you're asking whether 
the hospitalization rate amongst children is going to skyrocket? No, that's not going to happen. We feel very confident. We've played that uh, out for months and months. The data says that's not going to happen. Uh, so it's not just about cases. We're going to be dealing with COVID and high numbers of COVID cases for years. I really believe that. I hope not, but I, I believe it. I think this is, an, uh, this is something that our, we're all going to have to manage through. Now, we'll have so many more tools in the toolbox with therapeutics, with vaccinations uh, and whatnot to actually manage this in our, in our everyday lives. So, um, you know, the, the, the one silver lining, if you will, of this uh, terrible pandemic over the past year is it really doesn't affect children uh, and younger adults um, like it does um, older. And so that just, uh, the, the schools have shown that even when we do have, uh, college students are, this week are a great example. Most of those people, kids are all asymptomatic or very, very light symptoms. They're, the vast majority are gonna be just fine. And, um, and so, you know, we have that same confidence and have shown that model to be proven out to be very successful. I'm not sure. Is there a concern health-wise with school vacations with New Hampshire and Massachusetts these two weeks? Is there a concern that there could be more cases? Yeah, anytime, anytime I think that there's a vacation, it could be over a long weekend, or we saw a little bit of a, the Thanksgiving bump, a little bit of the Christmas bump. I imagine there'll be a little bit of a vacation bump as well. But again, within this population specifically, um, you know, even if there's a bump in cases, it's nothing that can't be managed and, and no reason to keep schools in a fully remote option you know, long term. You've heard, as you know, uh, the teacher union saying that teachers need to be vaccinated before all the schools can be open. I know you disagree with that. What can you uh, tell uh, us most, you? most everybody disagrees with that, by the way. Thank you. I wonder if you could update us on what, what's the best guess on when that next <coughs> Phase will I think early April is that's a, a rough guess right there. Sometime in the April time frame. I hope it's early April. Well, there's no promises on that, and we're looking at a couple different ways to do that. There's approximately 50,000 teachers, uh, administrators, um, and we'll make sure that it, that uh, Group 2A uh, does have. A, covers everybody, not just teachers in the classroom, but administrators, um, um, you know, janitors, um, you know, uh, substitute teachers, school bus drivers, those are all going to be included in that group. And, and again, there's a couple different ways to do it because that's all of 2A right there. So we could do it by school district. We could set up our own uh, internal sites by district. We could, you know, direct them directly to our already open sites across the state. So we're looking at a couple different ways to do it just to make sure that we're efficient um, and we get them their vaccines as, as well as we can so we can get to the group 2B as quick as we can. What do you think of the new administration's messaging on this? I don't know if you saw. Confusing. Yeah, I think, the, I think the Biden administration has been very confusing because they came out with the, with the right message, and it is the right message, when the CDC director, and they say, yes, of course, kids can be back in the classrooms where teachers don't need vaccinations to open up those classrooms. Uh, the president has said that, the CDC director has said that, and then they, I think politics got in the way and they tend to back away from that. So they've let politics kind of confuse the issue on their level, but we don't look at the politics. We look at the data, the science, and, and the successful models that we have, not just here in New Hampshire, but all across the country. And, and so we're just asking folks that, you know, the very few districts, I, I want to say there's like four or five, maybe a, a half dozen uh, school, schools and school districts that have not opened yet. It's very, very few here in New Hampshire. And so we're just asking them to look at those models and, and pick the path that, that best suits their needs and most importantly, their students' needs to be successful. Governor, we're still hearing from some people in phase 1B uh, who are medically qualified, who have had the doctors send in the information. Uh, they've been waiting for the call. Uh, they have not received the call, and they call 211, and 211 tells them to wait for the call. So, how many people are still in this situation, is your estimation, and what should these people do if they're still stuck in that limbo? Uh, very few. I mean, I appreciate there, there, are, there could be some out there, but of the 300,000 people, over 300,000 that qualified as Group 1B, um, that's, I feel very confident saying that's a very small percentage. So again, you know, if there's individuals, they should contact us, uh, whether it's through 211, through the website, going on to VAMS um, and just registering themselves, making sure that the doctor has truly given all the information. A lot of times doctors will pre-register them, but they don't have their email or the doctor didn't have the best phone number for them. So when they pre-register them, maybe their information has been out, uh, out of date. We, we found a lot of folks that, oh, I don't use that phone number anymore. I gave that phone number to my doctor a few years ago. So we're, we're trying to call them, but we're calling on a number that, hasn't, that the doctor gave us, but that hasn't been in, in service for a while. So there's all, there could be a variety of reasons why that happens, but it really is a very small percentage of folks. So um, you know, we just ask them to reach out and contact us as, as best they can. And, and again, we'll work with 2-on-1 to make sure the messaging is there and we can get folks uh, registered as appropriate. They do if they've checked all those boxes, they know the phone number is correct, but they call 2-on-1 and they're told to wait. So I mean, I guess it, we have one case in particular where somebody's hit this wall and they just don't know where to turn. 
Gee, yeah. I mean, let us know. I mean, listen, we're, again, one of the benefits of being here in New Hampshire is we're happy to put kind of a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, information on it. So I, I can't, I don't know that case in, in particular, but, um, and I'm not saying there aren't any out there. Of course, you're always going to have random cases here and there, but overall for the 300,000 folks that have got in, we, we obviously had a couple weeks ago, we had the scheduling snafu, but um, those issues and, and those bumps in the road have really been minimized. And I think we're just trying to put the best effort we can on it. So yeah, just let us know if there's, if there are individual cases out there. To reach herd immunity, um, are we getting there for no. like, no? No. 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 Look, well, what is herd immunity? Even Dr. Fauci, you know, talks about herd immunity at 80%, at 60%, at 70%. If, even if we had vaccination for everyone in the state, are 70, 75% of people in the state going to take the vaccination? Probably not. But within the 1B um, category, you said there's 300 people mm -hmm. that have signed up. There were 325 in that cohort. That's a very large, or there's an indication that they, they're a very large percentage of those people want the vaccination. Um, of the 300 and plus thousand that qualified under 1B, how many, I'm looking at Perry, how many do you think we actually have that have chosen to register for a vaccination? So there's a lot of double resident. There's a lot of double registration. Yeah. People couldn't couldn't get didn't get their email caught up in their spam, so they've registered three, four, five, six times. We're cleaning that up. Uh, Beth may have the numbers a little bit better, but two fifty, probably less. Probably less. So you know, I'm I'm going to be conservative and say maybe two hundred fifty thousand of the three hundred thousand in that group. But if you're talking herd immunity, you're talking about statewide or, or really large swath immunity. It can't just be. You don't just get herd immunity in, in the 65 years and old and up and, and call it a day because they interact with the community. Herd immunity on a scientific basis is really about not allowing the virus to be transmitted at all. In theory, if you have the right herd immunity, and I'm, I'm, pretending, to be, I'm pretending to have Dr. Chan's job for a second, so he'll come up and correct me. But in theory, the virus loses its ability to be transmitted. You don't just have the R0 value under one. It really gets uh, dropped precipitously. As we get further and further out with the 50 and up, the 40 and up, the, 20, the healthy 20-year-olds, are we going to have 75% of healthy 20-year-olds take this vaccine? I, I wish, I hope we do, and you should all get the vaccine, but right now probably not. We have to be realistic. So, you know, it's really about making sure that we're offering it to as many people as possible. In the long term, I mean, we hope as many people take it. It's safe. It's been proven that time over. It's a, completely effective against a, a, a removing folks from the risk of hospitalization or fatality, that's terrific. I mean, they all work really, really well. Um, but we've already seen just the numbers in the most vulnerable population still aren't at the 80 or 90 percent range, right? So, um, so it just, it's, I think it's just logical and, and to say, well, we're not going to keep restrictions on until we get to herd immunity. I don't know if there's a chance we never get there. If you get a, an appointment, and you get a better appointment, do you have to call and cancel it or does it automatic, is the system automatically set up? We're moving folks up. Out? Yeah, we're, move, we're the ones moving folks up for the better appointment. So yes, we would cancel that appointment. So you don't have to call back and say, hey, I, I already got the, the vaccine. No, because we'd be the one calling you to move you up. But if you go to a public health clinic like the-, um, the Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, no, that's I see. That's a very good question. So those are some of the, in in essence, that's a temporary duplication that we would have to go in and manually remove from the system. So that could take a little time as well. So if you get an opportunity to go to one of these low income sites, um, uh, community health clinics. If you qualify and have an opportunity, yeah, a lot of people kind of double qualify. I'm over 65, but you know I'm part of a, a homeless population, and and there's a mobile site coming in. Yeah, of course, get get that vaccine, and and but we'll take care should, of it on the other but end. But you should call the vans or if you can. State. Yeah, it'd be great and to know that. So you'd have an extra spot. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I'm. Am I saying that right, Perry? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I have another one on the executive order. Sure. Um, will they be required? full days or because I know there are some districts that are doing like half days at the moment uh, at least two days I mean I'm we're, I don't I'm not going to set an exact you have to be in for a certain number of hours but they kids have to have in-person learning at least two days a week to qualify as a hi hybrid model okay so technically it could be like a couple of you know half days that add up to two full days I suppose that would be horribly inefficient and 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 really missing the point of of, of doing this of actually opening the doors and the good like I said the good news is you're really only dealing with maybe a half dozen districts that uh, that are not uh, open at least in, in some fashion okay. so yeah. Governor how quick I know some of this is contingent on vaccine supply how quickly can you get through that population of 70,000 teachers and child care workers I guess what's the goal how quickly can they get vaccinated will they be done presumably before the end of the school year Oh, yes, absolutely. No, I, I mean, I think we could probably do it in a few weeks, a month, something like that. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that's why I kind of put the, the rough April to early May timeframe. 
Um, but yeah, with, if given the amount of vaccine we're getting, the amount of first doses we get on any given week, it's now, um, is it over 20,000? It's over 20,000 on every, any given week. So the math says that we should be able to work through that population. If they all choose to take it, by the way, that, then it's not going to be 100%. Um, but yeah, we should be able to work through that, that population in a few weeks. Can we hear from Dr. Daly about the percentage of people in long-term care who received the two doses of vaccine versus um, percentage of uh, clinics completed? I didn't even, that was the, the metric mm -hmm. we've been given. I'm just curious, how, what percentage of the long-term care population has actually been inoculated? Yeah, yeah, come on, you come up for the microphone. So the question is what percentage of the long-term care facility population has been um, vaccinated at this point? So when we look at these data, and you probably have heard that New Hampshire has one of the highest rates of vaccination in our long-term care facilities uh, for both residents and staff. And so uh, that is true. About 77% or so of the residents are getting vaccinated in these facilities. And all of the facilities at this point have had uh, that first dose vaccination opportunity. Um, and then uh, most of those individuals also go on to complete the second dose. I don't have that data with me today, but um, but it's very high. So it's getting close. I mean, if, if 80 percent is a considered threshold for a possible herd immunity, that's we're, we're on our way there. Yes, no, <laughs> in long-term care? Uh, we are in good shape in long-term care, but again, the, the vaccine's not 100 percent effective, nor do we have 100 percent of people vaccinated. So it won't, it's not going to completely eliminate this virus. But I guess given the, the number of outbreaks uh, are so significantly down, it's working. Can long-term care can they look to relaxing some of the restrictions? Mm -hmm. More no, visitation. Soon. I, I don't think we're, we're there yet. I mean, obviously, we want as much visitation as possible. Um, you know, if, you, if you're not in an outbreak and you don't have any, yeah, okay. I'm, <laughs> I think uh, Commissioner Shibinet knows I'm about to screw this answer up, so I'm going to let her answer. <laughs> Thank you. So a lot of the restrictions in long-term care come from our federal partners, not necessarily from our state partners. So what we're doing right now is we're working with our federal partners to really utilize uh, what we know today and maybe edit what the restrictions were in the spring because our information today is better than what it was in April or May when these restrictions were put in place. A lot of it is definition and open ter interpretation. So right now we are actively working on editing um, what we have in New Hampshire and working with our federal partners. Commissioner, one follow up for you. What happened yes. with the Philbrook building related to the uh, children uh, in the ER boarding? I know that was a solution that was discussed in September of last year. Did that, was that capacity just immediately filled? So the Philbrook building was, was, um, was built out to be transitional housing for adults. And we completely, um, yeah, we are full 100% of the time, 100% of the beds. It, it, it opened in September and we were almost immediately full. So those, uh, those beds, 16 beds there, they're 100% occupied. And so that was additional capacity that we built out. We also built out additional capacity on what was the children's unit. And basically what we're doing is we're taking one side of the kids unit, what was the kids unit that now housed 10 adults, and we're converting that back to children's services just for the time being. Just out of curiosity, ballpark, how much more capacity would the state need for, for there not to be an issue in the ERs? For kids? I guess globally. Oh, globally? I, I, I don't believe it's a bed issue. And, and I, I, I've, I've talked about this numerous times over the last couple of years is that um, at the same time as we have 40 people waiting to come into New Hampshire Hospital, we have 60 waiting to go out, and we have a lack of community services. So our strategy is around building supported community housing in the community um, and, and enhancing the community supports that we give people to live and live a good quality of life in the community. So I don't necessarily think we need additional beds. I think we need additional additional inpatient beds. I think we need different types of beds, supported uh, housing beds, uh, transitional housing beds, affordable housing beds. Those are the types of beds we need, not necessarily in a hospital. Uh, this is pretty exciting. Uh, the Fisher Cats announced that May 11th yes. 
uh, they'll be doing their season opener. Um, does that mean that uh, we'll start to have some events indoor, you know, SNHU or outdoor that we'll be able to have uh, whatever kinds of events? And yeah, and those kinds of I things. think that's the hope. I think a lot of people, you know, are gearing up for that, as, as I believe they should. I think this summer could be a, a, a very a great opportunity. I think hopefully by this fall, especially when you get to fair season and things like that, um, that those opportunities are happening. But those take months to plan. And so I think folks are doing right by at least planning and, and, and assuming that uh, that these trajectories that we've seen, this, these data trends that we're seeing, the success of the vaccine, uh, all leads to things being much more relaxed and, and a, with a lot more opportunity. So the Fisher Cats announcement was great. You know, that, that's a terrific organization in Manchester. It's run very well. They've got a great relationship with Major League Baseball. Um, it was unfortunate to see across the country you had certain minor league teams have to close up uh, their stadiums, but not here in Manchester and, and in New Hampshire. And we're very proud of that, partly because um, there's a lot of great attendance there. There's, um, it's a very well-run organization and, and provides a, a lot of support, not just to our community, but they do a lot of community support as well. So we're just thrilled that they're, they're going to be open and they're going to be playing ball in, in May. Continuing on that question, there's probably a lot of brides out there wondering about their summer, um, the, uh, as well as concerts. Mm -hmm. Um, all sorts of um, open venues um, and ca summer camps. Will you be revisiting some of the restrictions related to COVID-19 in the coming months, especially those specific to the summer? I, I anticipate. I think we all anticipate revisiting all those uh, restrictions that we've put on. Again, you can have weddings here and all of that sort of thing. You can even have a summer camp uh, going. We, we did last summer. Um, but hopefully we can provide some more flexibility and restrictions. But it all has to be data-driven. It isn't because I want it to be. It isn't because we hope it should be. It, it really has to be because, again, we do the right things, keep wearing the mask, social distancing, keep the numbers down. Hopefully as the more folks take the vaccine, uh, it works, especially in the vulnerable populations, and uh, the hospitalization rate really can, can plummet. Is there um, a key metric that you'll be looking at in that? Ho hospitalization and, and fatality, absolutely. Um, that's, I mean, that's it. And, and the demographics of that, not just the overall number, but the actual demographics surrounding that. Uh, I'm not saying we're ignoring the number of cases in the state, but that becomes much, much less of an issue because we know that the cases can be high with still, with, with, without creating, with, without having um, people get the very severe symptoms that would require hospitalization or, or even cause a fatality. And that's what it's all about. Um, I imagine, I don't know, I guess I, I assume that at some point we're all going to get some form of COVID, right? But the vast majority of us will be able to, you know, have those symptoms. It'll be, they'll be minor. There'll be therapeutics in case it gets too, too severe. And then uh, obviously, even if we need boosters every year, you know, hopefully that'll become available. Um, but we'll see how all that plays out. But right now, I think everyone knows we're on a very, very good track here. One sure. More? Sorry. And then we'll go, um, yeah, then we'll go to the phones. Um, should colleges and prep schools um, and other um, housed, housed education um, be allowed to let their their students leave um, with quarantine restrictions to go home if they... If they're in state, then we do allow them to go home, but they should not be put on public transportation to fly home if they're from out of state or public buses. Of course, we, we, we reemphasize that all the time. And I think that the university systems have been very good about trying to manage that as best they can. Um, I mean, look, if students are, are living off campus and you know, they, they take their own path. I, I suppose that can happen from time to time. But I know the universities have been very, very strong about making sure that that doesn't happen and, and trying to tell folks, look, just quarantine where you, where you live. If you want to go home to your home within New Hampshire, obviously that's fine. But you have to maintain those quarantine provisions and staying away from public transportation or, or large gatherings outside of your immediate family is very important. Let's take a few on the phone. Okay, Governor. Um, the first phone question comes from Michael Graham at the New Hampshire Journal. Michael, please go ahead with your question. So, big announcement about uh, reopening schools, but a setback for your uh, education freedom accounts that you've been supporting in the uh, House today when the bill was not moved forward. And it's one of the things you talked about as a solution in the future when there's a problem with opening schools and giving parents more options. Um, what's your response to that, and uh, what would you say to the uh, people on the committee and in the House uh, who are unable to move it forward? Well, again, that, that was not my bill per se. We really didn't have any direct input on that bill. Um, I know there were some amendments. I couldn't even tell you what those amendments were. I know there's another bill in the Senate being moved forward, and so there's still an opportunity to do it. So like any legislative process, I think they're just trying to do it right. But i, I got to be honest, the, the Senate and the House are the ones you really have to ask about that. I think it's a good idea. 
Um, but obviously you have to do it the right in the right way and you need to get the votes and hopefully some bipartisan support if, if possible and it does create a lot of opportunity but again I we weren't really that wasn't my bill we weren't really driving driving on it so I can't speak too much about the hows and whys oh okay. uh, governor our next question comes from Todd Bookman at New Hampshire Public Radio Todd please go ahead with your question Thank you. I, I've got two two questions. First, could, could you clarify what vaccination sites are supposed to do with any leftover doses at the end of the day that are on the, the verge of expiring? And does that guidance change if it's a, a hospital versus a community health clinic? And then second, um, uh, we, we, you mentioned the rise in, in cases in college towns. Is the state taking any additional action, you know, to work with, with colleges or college towns to try to keep these cases from, from spreading into the broader community? Sure. Sure. So, um, if if there are cases, and there usually are of, of a little bit of vac of a little bit of vaccine that has been essentially thought out, ready to go, but but isn't used at the end of the day, I think the, the vast majority of our vaccination sites have done a very good job just uh, bringing people in. They always have a phone list that they can go to, where they can call folks and bring them in and make sure that that none of that uh, gets wasted, or at least a, a minimal amount uh, gets wasted. Um, and I think we've been very very good. I think we're at or below or around one percent uh, of waste, um, which you know you don't want anything wasted, but that's that's a pretty darn good statistic in terms of the colleges yeah I'm, I'm I've been on the phone and, and talking to both the university system or, or I know the Department of Public Health has been uh, individuals have been talking to folks in the private uh, colleges and universities and just reiterating um, that we're here for them whatever they need in terms of resources or, or whatever it might be um, I think they have been doing a very good job um, with their you know trying to maintain the guidance um, it really is up to the students to adhere to it right it, it really is up to the students to I think have their best practice is in place in terms of, of masking and social distancing, mass work. I mean, they, there's no question. Mass absolutely works. Social distancing works. It, it's not a coincidence that there's virtually no flu. I mean, there's virtually no flu around America or in this state right now. Sinus infections are down. Ear infections are down. There's a reason because what we're doing actually really does work. And so the proof is there. Um, you know, I don't mean to take take us off on a tangent on, on the question, but I think uh, colleges are doing a, a good job with their guidance, pushing the messaging. And unfortunately, those schools who have gone had to go remote, I mean, the message is there. If you want to be in class, you, you kind of have to do the right things to, to kind of make sure that that can be done in a, in a safe and healthy atmosphere. And so uh, we'll keep working with them, make sure all resources are available. It's not a funding issue. They're still testing like crazy, which I think is wonderful. And uh, we'll just keep, stay with them kind of every step of the way until they uh, kind of get this under control and, and hopefully get those numbers down. Governor, the next question comes from Tony Shinella with Patch. Tony, please go ahead with your question. Thank you, Governor. Question about the Wyndham voting irregularities from the general election. If you're not familiar with the situation, there was a bizarre discrepancy found during the recount of the Rockingham District 7 state rep race, where four Republican candidates were shorted between 297 and 303 votes. A fifth place finisher, a Democrat, lost 99 votes. And then three other Democrats were found to have been shorted 18 to 28 votes. The Attorney General's office is, is reviewing this case, but many are calling for a public investigation, including an accounting of the number of ballots cast in the community and auditing of the software of the voting machine, and at least one other hand recount in the race to find out what happened or if there were any other problems. And there are no laws or provisions to provide for this type of investigation. So I'm wondering, should you be taking a leadership role, say, by signing an executive order to force an investigation or some other action to find the underlying cause of what happened in Wyndham? And if not, why not? Thank sure. You. So the, there's a couple uh, issues here. Number one, the Attorney General's Office is doing a review. Uh, that's underway, and we should have kind of their internal review of, of what happened and why uh, in the short term. I know there's a bill being uh, discussed in the Senate uh, that would also provide for that audit process, uh, whether it's a, a recount or just an audit of the machines. I, I haven't uh, seen exactly, but I know that they're looking at that, and I think those are all very appropriate steps to take, absolutely. So I think uh, the state is coming at it from a couple different angles. Um, the only silver lining of any of this is the fact that in a state like New Hampshire, we're talking about 300 votes. And, and that's not to be minimized. Every vote matters. But you have states that are looking at, you know, 
issues with 300,000 votes. Uh, and the fact that we can get granular and focus on, you know, one or maybe two machines, I'm not sure what it is, or the hand counting around 300 individual votes, I think that speaks to the immense integrity of our system, um, you know, the in, in incredible accuracy uh, through all the different communities in the state. We're talking about one or two machines in one community. Um, and of course, we're not going to let that sl slip by. We're going to attack it uh, at all levels and make sure that, that we really get to the root of the problem to make sure that even though it may have been a small problem, uh, that it isn't systematic across anything. And, and that, again, just reassures folks, I think, that, that we have a great system in place to deal with these issues going forward. And Governor, the next question comes from Karen Dandoran with Seacoast Online. Karen, please go ahead with your question. Ah, thank you, Governor. Hey, I have two questions, actually, and they're both kind of related. Um, I've been looking at uh, the Beckett Hospital survey, and there's similar, um, sur similar surveys done by the New York Times and the Washington Post, basically rating states on how they're doing percentage-wise and giving out the vaccinations they're taking in. And New Hampshire came in 48 of the states saying that um, doses distributed to the state were 321,625, doses administered 216,649, giving you a percentage of 67.36 distributed. So I'm asking why that might be and wondering if it's because you're holding some back for the second dose or if there's another reason. That's the first question. The second one is related to that. People that are concerned about this say that with the variants, they think that getting one dose of the vaccine is better than getting no doses in regards to ending up with less severe cases if they do get COVID through one of the variants. Those are my questions. Uh, sure. So, uh, I, I'm sorry. What was the second question? One is better than none, but I didn't. I missed the question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, people are concerned that. If you're with, if you are withholding doses of the vaccination for some reason, for the second doses or whatever reason, no. that they think it's better with the variants if you're giving out people at least one dose, even if you can't get to the second one right away yeah. because of the variants. No, okay, so let's be clear. We are withholding nothing back. There's nothing being withheld. Okay. Uh, so that is, uh, I, whoever's saying that or, or whatever you're reading, that is 100% uh, not true. Uh, the Beckett Hospital survey, frankly, is massively inaccurate. I know this New York Times thing, uh, it's really questionable about where they're even getting the data. I've seen it. I know exactly what you're, what you're talking about. If you go to the CDC website, we're around the national average. You know, we're ranked around 25th or something like that in terms of administration. And that's about where we are. Uh, so I, don't, I can't speak to the Beckett survey because that's a private individual survey. It's done with the, the newspaper, and nobody really knows exactly where they're getting their data. But there's, we're not 48th. I can, I can promise you that. Uh, our system has just been working way too well, uh, you know, to, and, and the numbers uh, bear that out to be sure. In terms of the second question, um, look, one, one dose is better than none, but one dose is not effective against preventing uh, the hospitalization or fatality from this. So you really need to get the second dose. Um, so yes, one is supposedly better than none, especially when it comes to the symptoms. But uh, for this vaccine to really work, you have to get the second dose for the Pfizer and Moderna. Obviously, there'll be a lot of opportunity when Johnson & Johnson releases theirs, as that looks to be a single shot. Um, and so, uh, no, you, you really need to get the second dose. We're withholding absolutely nothing back. I, um, I, to be honest, those, both those questions are just based on, on bad information. I, I don't know a better way to, to say it than them, and, and we, can, I can, we can stand by that 100%. We're doing very well here. And you're doing very well on the phones. We're also Okay, here. great, excellent. Anything else here? I'm back. Sure. Um, AP, uh, uh, no, um, the, um, I'm wondering about who you are going to choose to be your new attorney general. Have you uh, I'm not going <laughs> to. No, We're, I, I've interviewed. So the question, sorry, that kind of took me by surprise. Uh, who is going to be the next attorney general? I'm not sure. We're interview. We have some amazing candidates. I'm interviewing a variety of different people right now. So no, I, I'm not quite sure. But I hope to have some type of, uh, of announcement or nomination, and oh, maybe even by the next council meeting or so, um, something like that in the next few weeks. But you know, there's a lot of great candidates out there. It's a very important job. It is. It's a 27-hour-a-day job, and, and Gordon McDonald, he's left some very big shoes to fill, to be sure. But we got some great candidates that we're interviewing. As far as the scheduling snafu that you had, I know with Perry's help and Dr. Daly have gotten through this, but I know ideally you'd like to have a state system where mm -hmm. plates vamps. Um, 
What's the time frame for that? Yeah, I think, yeah, so we have the option to bring a new state system on. We're going to do that, to be sure. Um, and we have a couple different options even there. We're looking at, at, at some options there. The vast majority of folks in 1B are already in the system. And so I think we've made the decision we're probably going to run with the system that we have, and then we'll kind of start with a, a clean slate as we open up either 2A or 2B or, or those, uh, those new groups, because that way folks come in, it's a one-stop shop. Otherwise, you really have to ensure that you're transferring hundreds of thousands of pieces of data from the old system to the new, and it's, there's very little benefit of doing that at this point. So um, very likely by the time the next, by 2A and 2B, we'll get that up and running. But there's no rush to do it because we really don't want to confuse the, the phases. To try to keep them, you know, try to have a clean break, if you will, to move in into this new, newer and much more efficient system. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I hope everyone stays tuned uh, for the Ellen Show. We have a New Hampshire uh, hero that's uh, going to be highlighted there, so that's very exciting. We'll be back next week with another update, but keep wearing your masks. Keep with the social distancing. It is working. There's no doubt about it. That data doesn't lie. We're on a great, great track here. The vaccines are coming out. Sign up. Get the second shot as well, uh, but sign up if you're in 1B, and uh, we'll keep moving people up by the thousands. Every week, we are moving more and more people that were scheduled in April. They're getting moved up, so pick up the phone because we're probably calling, uh, if you're scheduled out in April, we're probably calling uh, to get you moved up either within our system or the new Walgreens partnership. Huge opportunity as more vaccine comes in to just accelerate the process and get through this as fast as we can. Thank you guys very much. Thanks, David. All right, you're just watching as state officials provided an update on New Hampshire's coronavirus response. Let's take a look at the latest numbers. There are 461 new cases of COVID-19 in New Hampshire. 141 of them are traced to colleges. There are currently 3,048 active cases in the state. 72,426 total cases since the pandemic began. There are 126 hospitalizations. That number is declining. Two new deaths announced today linked to long term care facilities. Overall, 1,150 Granite Staters have died. Now, as far as vaccinations, 228,000 doses have been administered in New Hampshire. 156,000 people have received their first dose. That's roughly 11% of New Hampshire's population. 72,000 people have received their second shot. That's about 5% of our state's population. This week, New Hampshire received 22,475 vaccine doses. Next week, the state anticipates receiving 27,740 doses, so roughly a 5,000 increase there. And an update on schools now. Governor Sununu saying that he is signing an executive order requiring schools to offer a hybrid learning model by March 8th. That means at least two days per week of in-person learning need to be offered in all districts. We'll have much more of this and a total recap tonight on WMUR News 9 at 5. See you then.